All right, and we are live. Welcome to another episode of Mentor Minutes. This is just a chance for leaders from around the world to come together and ask questions. If there's any obstacles that you're facing in your day, any problems, any gnawing frustrations with an employee, a peer, a boss, this is just a neutral place where you can ask the question. I will take some of the theory and the principles of leadership and try to come up with some practical and actionable and timely ways for you to deal with whatever situation it is that you're dealing with. So if you're coming to this episode late, if you happen to miss the live session or you're watching this on YouTube or listening to it on the podcast, you can always drop your questions into the comment section. I always check those areas first before I go live again and, and use those to kind of address issues while we wait for some people to queue up here. Cindy, so good to see you here today. The first question I have actually came in through a direct message on Facebook, and you can be anonymous, send me an email, cm at cameronmorsey.com, or direct message through Facebook, I'll keep you anonymous. And the question was, is how do you react and deal with a situation where your boss skips over you and goes directly to your people? And my first response to that is that this may not be an issue or a problem at all. If you are leading well, and this is a, a lot of those things that we worry about as leaders, I would rather reframe and look at that as a challenge to your leadership. And I mean that as a challenge in a good way, in a way that, that uncovers issues. So if you are concerned about your boss skipping over you and going directly to your people, my que first question would be, why? Why are you concerned about that? What in your leadership is going to be reflected in that? Could he or she uncover by going directly to your people? What are you people going to say about you? And that can provide, that little bit of introspection can provide areas where you can improve as a leader. You may be perfectly fine as a leader right now, but there can be areas of improvement. There's always areas of improvement. Right, Michelle? Um, good to see you here. So that's my first question is, why is this something that is a concern to you? The, the other thing that I would always recommend is I would recommend encouraging that to a certain extent where certain things are, but go to your boss and make it relevant to them to not go directly to your people, but to go to you. And the way that you do this, the easiest way is time factor. Well, it's so good to see you here. Um, so it's a timely factor. You know, I know you went to Cameron um, earlier to get that information. If you want, you can just direct that at me. I'll do all the legwork and the heavy lifting for you. That way you can spend your time doing other things. So you get the, um, you give them a reason as to why it is beneficial for them to go through you as to go as opposed to going through your people. Rudolph, so good to see you here. And that's really what you want to do. When you want to negotiate, sales, negotiation, all of those things, you want to focus on what the other person wants. And you want to frame what you're asking of them in a way that addresses what it is that they want. So what does your boss want? More time, more results, whatever that is. Phrase them going through you as opposed to your team that way. The other thing is to simply ask your team members what it is that the boss talked about. Hey, I saw that you know, Sam was over here looking for some information. What was it that uh, they were after? I'll make sure that they get that updated in the future so that you can, um, so that they don't have to go to you. This identifies areas of miscommunication between you and your boss. Again, why are they going to your people? That's the question. Why, why, why? What is the practical reason? Not the emotional reason of they don't trust you or all of that junk, all of that emotional stuff. If those are issues, then we have bigger problems to talk about here. But why are they going to, going to your people? What information can you feed them so that they don't have to, to do it themselves? What reports can you update to make give them more information so that they don't have to go to your people? If your boss is skipping over you to go to the team, the question is, why are you concerned about that from a team perspective? Why are you concerned about for that from the boss perspective? And what does that tell you about what you can do to improve communication and improve your own leadership? Um, and that's that's such a huge key here. Mark, so good to see you here. Um, if you're treating people right, they will tell your boss. And that's that's just it, Mark. I would be thrilled if the team members came, you know, went back when I was in the workforce. I'm thrilled if the boss comes and talks to my team because I'm not afraid of what they are going to tell them about my leadership. 
because I'm treating them well. I'm engaging them. I'm, I'm asking them questions. I'm instilling ownership in how they're doing. I'm praising them when they do something right. I'm giving them constructive feedback in areas that they can improve on. So that's a great point to put, Mark. I'm glad you threw that out there. Shelly, good to see you here as well. So as we queued up some visitors here, if you have any questions, any struggles, any frustrations you have with an employee, a peer, a boss, drop them down into the comment section here. We'll go ahead and tackle those. The other thing that I wanted to get to is I just got off a, a coaching call with a client and she was very concerned about uh, talking skip levels today. Her boss's boss wanted to meet with her and the last time that they met, it was not a pleasant conversation. The boss's boss is not, not somebody who sees the positive in things, very politically minded, very kind of manipulative. So it wasn't a pleasant conversation. And so the fear is, is what on earth does she want to talk about now? That's what, that's, that's the concern. And Mazam, so good to see you here. So you're going to have those meetings where it is a meeting with your boss. It might be a meeting with a client where it feels like it's going to be bad. It's almost got to be bad news, something bad, but you have no earthly idea what it's about. And this may happen in your personal life as well. The important thing to do is to A, get clear on what some of the possibilities are. What is the worst case scenario? What is the best case scenario? It is very likely that this particular individual is being talked to for a promotion. That's your best case scenario. The worst case scenario is that she's being talked to and told that she should probably find work elsewhere. That's your worst case. Get clear on that. A lot of times our minds spin around on the unknown because it's the unknown. So get clear on some of those possibilities. Sherry Bill, glad you tuned in today. The other thing is, and it's almost an after the fact sort of thing. I don't even want to get into the whole put it out of your mind, that sort of thing. What I want you to do is that when you get done with this meeting that you are concerned about, that's, that's consuming your brain power for weeks on end, when you have this come up and when you go through it, I want you to reflect back on it. Now, what will happen with this and, and why I talk about this is we will have those instances where we will always be nervous. I have no problem speaking in front of hundreds of people. I've spoken in front of hundreds of people lots of times, not an issue. However, I do get nervous before I go up on stage every single time. That's part of the natural aspect of things. Fritz, so good to see you here. And again, anybody who has any questions, I'm pretty much caught up, so I'll be tackling in real time. So go ahead and drop down your questions and I'll get right to it. But you're going to feel those natural nerves. But what you want to acknowledge is you want to acknowledge what comes out of that conversation. It's almost like a bell curve. And that means that the vast majority of the issues that come up in, in those meetings that you're concerned with aren't bad at all, aren't bad, aren't good, or just play basically just blah. Then there's a certain percentage that are great, the meeting goes way better than you anticipated, and there's a certain percentage that are bad. But what you realize is you're worried about that small one in 10 chance, one in five chance that the meeting is bad, when in reality, the vast majority of the time, it is perfectly fine. So reflect on that and that will help ease that concern down the road. I don't get worried about stepping out on stage. I might get nervous, but I don't have concerns about how I'm going to perform because I've been through it before. When you go through these meetings over and over again, where you're really not and you're really not sure how it's going to turn out, why you're there, but it feels like it's a bad setup, it feels like a bad scene from a movie, then you're going to realize down the road that things are much better. Eileen, good to see you here, and I'll start taking a couple of questions. Um, owners of the company are in the midst of a divorce, and the atmosphere at work. Oh, I'm glad to see things have gotten even worse in regards to that boss-wife uh, relationship, Cindy. Heavy sarcasm on my part. Sorry about that. Um, has changed directly. I get along well with both of them. He is my boss and she is now my friend. I am between them and I'm concerned that I will be placed in the middle eventually and it will affect my position and future with the company. Um, what are your suggestions with moving forward? Um, Cindy, I try to bring some transparency. When, when all else fails, when you're in the middle of a difficult situation, what my default reaction to that is to be truthful and to be transparent. And so it may come to a point where um, you need to have that discussion with the husband, your boss, and with the wife, your friend, and say, hey, you know I have interactions with both of you. I want you to know that what is said to me by either one of you is sacrosanct. It is not gonna be discussed 
one way or another. For your boss, hey, I'm here to work, I'm here to do a great job. As a friend, I'm here to support you, but there's going to be limits to that because I know your husband, I work with your husband, I still interact with your husband. These are all truthful things. You know, yeah, sure, they might want you to side with them at some point. But you know what? Throwing it out there and throwing the basics and the logic and the why behind it at some point really helps that out. The other thing is, in the meantime, I'm not saying necessarily to dive right into that right now, but in the meantime, make sure that you are already being as trustworthy as possible, that you are not going down that route. If they start going down that route, maybe say, hey, you know what, we, we don't need to talk that, let's keep it business. Or hey, we can talk about something else here. I wanna say deflect the conversation, but move the conversation onto another topic. Don't get trapped in anything because it's gonna come up down the road. But I would really look to have a transparent conversation. It, I, I, I suspect given some of the prior instances that you've had with these individuals, I would suspect that it's going to come to a head like that where you are gonna to have to have that conversation and say, hey, I, I work with you, I'm friends with her, that doesn't mean that I am choosing sides. I'm not. I'm staying neutral. I'm Switzerland. Anything you tell me, anything that you infer, anything like that is not going to be discussed with her. She can ask me what's going on all she wants and I'm not going to tell her anything. Likewise, you can ask me all, all you want about her, but I'm not going to tell you any of that. And that's just because I'm respecting the friendship, I'm respecting our work relationship. Bring that transparency out, be as honest and truthful. That'll build some trust, it, even if they don't like it, and they might not, even if they don't like it, it will build trust. And that's what's going to carry you through this difficult time. Sorry you find yourself in that situation. That is the issue um, if you have your own company. If you are looking to hire a friend or a family member, these are the issues that come along with that. There's some positives as far as from a trust standpoint, hiring a, a family member, there's a lot of trust um, that comes along with that. However, there's a lot of difficulties as well and it's felt by everybody in the organization, not just, not just um, you. How to know if your subordinate is ready for a promotion? Shareable has the question. The, the thing that I look for is I look for behavior, Shareable. Are other people coming to them? Glad you like it, Cindy, and, and best of luck with that situation. Are other people coming to them? I, I tell people I can step into an organization, I can figure out who the leader is in the organization really within a few minutes usually. And that is, who is it that everybody goes to when they have a question, when there's a crisis? when there's a problem, some sort of confusion that goes on. And oftentimes it's not the person with the title that's sitting in the corner off, it's somebody out on the floor. How comfortable are the other people coming to this individual for advice, for handling situations, that sort of thing? That is really the litmus test for leadership um, in particular and to know whether they're ready for a promotion or not. Now, if they aren't displaying that, so, Let's say that nobody is coming to them. So if they aren't displaying that, but you think they do have potential for a promotion, you can go ahead and encourage that by giving them a chance to take on a special project on their own, to tutor or mentor or train people, training probably is best, in some new procedure that comes out. There's always something new. There's a new product, there's a new procedure, there's a new person that comes on board. Have them start training people. That's a great way to get people to come to them with questions on certain things. You can also direct people to them to see how the, that interaction goes. So somebody might come to me and have a question. I say, you know who would be really good to ask about that? Sherry Bell. Sherry Bell would be great to ask about that. And so you direct people to them and you can monitor and see how that interaction works. But so much of leadership is how they interact with other people and whether other people are comfortable coming to them with questions and with feedback. That will determine how successful they are as a leader. If you don't see that right now, you can look to encourage it through some of those behaviors that I mentioned and see whether it takes root. If none of that takes root, then this might be a person who is a great individual performer, but might not be best suited for management and leadership, or they may need way more training in management and leadership to be successful at it. Great question, Sherry Bell, I love that. Um, next one, um, Next question is from Mazam, and it is, besides recognizing your star team players for their great work, what are other ways to make them feel rewarded um, Rewarded if any special bonuses are not approved? So much of it is the recognition that you say right there. 
But your star players also want an opportunity to do some new things. So whether it is a new project that comes along, training is a great way of recognizing your star performers. So you have a new person coming in, you know what, I'm gonna have them sit down with Mazam because Mazam knows what he's talking about. And Mazam's gonna be able to train them up. So give them opportunities to do different things. That's another form of recognition, doesn't cost you a darn thing, but that's, that's one of the best ways is to continue to develop them. Your star players generally want to continue to develop their expertise. You can go ahead, call them, you can give them, you know, if you can't train them, if you can't, uh, you know, give them any other expertise or something like that or have, a, have them train people, what you can do is you can call them out as gurus. Um, that's another great way of, of phrasing it. So you know what, Mazam, you are number one as far as sales are concerned. You are now the sales guru. So if people have questions, I'm gonna feel free to direct them to you. You can go ahead and answer those questions. Or maybe you pick their brain for the top 10 sales techniques. What makes them great in a particular area? So your star players, give them areas of expertise that they can own pull out the top five tips that they have on those particular areas and share them with the team to form a peer recognition that goes on. So look to, to continue to develop them, look to give them opportunities to develop others, and then give them that guru status, shall we say, in regards to certain areas of expertise where you drill a little bit deeper, perhaps, into what makes them a star player. Those are my recommendations. Pay hey, money, accolades, those are all fantastic as well, but if you can't have all those, you can at least do some of these as well. Um, Cindy, Sherabelle, good. Glad you both liked those. Um, if anybody has any questions out there, I am, I am caught up right now in this episode of Mentor Minutes, so drop down into the comment section, and, that's some, and, that, uh, and I'll go ahead and get to that question right away. Oh, there we go. And on cue, Wasim has there. Any other questions, drop down. I'll handle them after Wasim's here. Um, how do you deal with difficult team player who doesn't want to admit mistakes and doesn't know how to receive constructive feedback? Always difficult, always difficult. So whether it is a team player that you have, whether it is a subordinate that you have, it is difficult to get those things across. One of the best things to do is to try to get black and white with numbers, okay? One of the issues with feedback is too often we're concerned and nervous about, it blames everyone but themselves. Yeah, Clarissa gets his, his second on this one. So too often we're worried about how somebody is gonna receive feedback. And so what happens is we dip almost into the emotional. We get fuzzy, we don't get specific, okay? So you wanna get as specific as possible. And so one of the best ways is if you, could, if you have hard numbers or you have hard, you know, super hard specific examples, that's where you wanna live, where there is no gray area. Uh, one of the ways that I, I teach people to do this in leadership is to actually stack rank your people. So you might be that you're in a sales environment or you're shipping stuff out of a warehouse or you're processing invoices, whatever it is. Go ahead, list all of the salespeople or all of your employees in regards to that particular metric. And so you can see where you stand as far as sales, as far as orders shipped, whatever that happens to be. You can go ahead and blank out all of the other names, but you at least let the person see where they rank. And this happens a lot with people who have been with the organization for a lot of years and thinks, think that they are just the cat's meow and don't recognize how good everybody else is and how the world is kind of passing them by. It's a splash of water in their face. You want to make sure to get very specific. You also want to choose what to give feedback on. If you have somebody who blames everybody else, who doesn't receive constructive criticism, be mindful that you might want to try to pry open that defensiveness with one of those hard and fast metrics, okay? Hey, we have not delivered well for four weeks. Whatever, whatever the, the example is, start small, start with something simple, start with something obvious, open it up a little bit, give them a little practice receiving that feedback and that's something that can really help out and help, helpfully get you across the finish line as far as getting them to start taking that feedback constructively. The other thing to do is to give the excuse. Beat them to it is, is, is the way that I phrase it. So, hey, we did not, we did not meet our, our, our deadlines on this you know, for the last four weeks. And we, I know that we had issues here, here, and here, but I think we could have anticipated those. And so you've hit, them, you've hit their top three excuses right off the bat. And so you've acknowledged those, and then you're still 
bringing up more. Okay, it's still asking for more. So beat them to the punch. Hard and fast, very specific. Start small, start obvious, and then beat them to the punch as far as those excuses are concerned, or at least anticipate them and what your response is going to be in the future, and that will help you have a better conversation in regards to that. So again, any other questions, drop them down into the comment section here. I did have another scenario that popped up where uh, the individual, and I'll, you know what, I'll go ahead and handle share bells here first. When you put um, corrective action on a teammate, do I have to tell the whole team just for them to know what happened? Is transparency needed for this situation? No. Uh, a quick answer on this share bell is no. You always criticize, you always discipline in private. What happens is in, in most organizations is the people around that particular individual know what happened. And so you will run into a situation where you will write somebody up and they will claim that you are playing favorites, that you didn't notice it in this case, in this case, in this case. And this is where you go back to being a good leader who is fair, who is consistent, who makes the tough decisions and does the hard things when necessary. And so if you've held everybody to the same expectation and the same standard, then you shouldn't have a problem with these, this communication. You know what? I don't play favorites in regards to that. And if you bring up specific instances or if, if I'm aware of specific instances, I address them exactly how I'm addressing them with you here. In fact, I've addressed the same issue with numerous teammates. But just like you wouldn't want me naming your name out there, I don't go broadcasting that out. And they've chosen to apparently keep it to themselves. But trust me, I'm being fair and I'm applying it across the board. Okay, and so that's a challenge to you. Getting back to one of the first things we talked about in, in today's episode, that's a challenge. If you're concerned about that, um, then what does that say? What questions does it have in regards to your leadership and what areas can you address on that? But from a, a standpoint, getting back to your question here, no, you don't make it transparent to the team. You let them know that you're fair and that you apply the expectations across the board when needed, but you don't need to announce when you write somebody up Oftentimes, just group dynamics, the people around them will know that they got a slap on the hand for something. They may not know the specifics of it, and that eventually gets out to everybody else. So any other questions, drop them down in the comment section here. Um, I did want to address one other thing that came up, and that was an individual um, had a group together a, a number of projects. They're redoing the procedures, streamlining the procedures across multiple divisions. And they, they threw out their plan for this, and it was a two-year plan. Problem number one, that I would say. But then the, the directors of those people that oversaw the different divisions that were being affected by this wanted to come up with their own plan because they didn't necessarily buy into it. So this, the question is, she has the feeling that it's all going to come back to her regular plan on this. They're going to have a meeting in another month on this. But how should she deal with the feedback as it comes in? So... First of all, I'm not a big fan of two-year plans um, in, in organizations and departments because priorities change, people change, all kinds of things change. I like, you know, to, at, the long, at the long end of the spectrum, six to nine months. Obviously, that's not, you know, you're building a casino down here in Las Vegas. It's more than two years to do that. But in general, I would rather she have chunked that up. So chunk, do, do the simple, easy things first, build some momentum, take those successes, those lessons learned, and then apply it to the medium difficulty stuff, and then take those lessons learned and apply it to the, to the, uh, the more difficult stuff. So you don't lay out a two-year plan, you lay out a six-month plan, and then a further six-month, and a further six-month, and a further six-month. The other thing is just general feedback in, for, for uh, project planning and for teams. When you go out and say what you're going to do, and people want to give their feedback on it. Now, most of the time, and I, I will say most of the time, I will give you, the viewer out there, the benefit of the doubt that you put the, together a really good plan that will work, and that most of the time that's gonna come back to being the one that gets put into place. But what I want you to do is I want you to take the opportunity of that feedback, all right? The more people feel involved in a particular change, in a particular project, in a particular process, the more performance you are going to get out of them. So in this case, my recommendation is, is that you don't necessarily poo-poo the plans that come back and go back to the original plan. I want you to look for those nuggets of, and ideas and wisdom that might be housed in there that you can bring in. 
So you might say, you know what, uh, the, you know, this might not work, this might work, but this is great, this is great, and I'm gonna go ahead and bring that in. And what you do with this, and for leaders, this is a great thing to do with, with people when you're asking for ideas and what they think they should do and that sort of thing. If it's a toss-up, or if both the ways, the way you do it and the way they do it are pretty much equal, choose the way that they would do it. It gets more ownership and gives you actually a better chance of success. Quite frankly, if it's a 55-45, you probably take the 45 just because you're going to get more ownership and buy-in, which actually makes up for the difference in, in, uh, in quality, perhaps. So look at that as an opportunity. Don't do huge projects that are two years long if you can chunk it up into you know six month blocks and then look to take the nuggets of wisdom and the good ideas from that feedback that you got. And even though the plan doesn't change or we end up going with your plan, there's some little tweaks that to take place that help bring more people in, drive a little bit of ownership, more buy-in, and that's gonna lead to better performance. Um, Rudolph has a question. It's if you disagree at some points with how your company is managing some internal business procedures and processes that are affecting your activity, how can you make an impact on it? <sighs> is managing some internal business procedures. What you want to do is try to prevent, pre bleh, present the solution, Rudolph. So what is your solution for it? What is your different way of doing it? And how is it better? And how is it easier? And it's that second point that'll re that really drives it over the fence. People will sacrifice quality and better procedures if they view it as more difficult. So it needs to be easier and it needs to be better, whatever those procedures are. So you need to do the legwork on this. And I know that sucks because that's probably not your area of expertise. That's not your area of responsibility. But what this is, is it's a chance for you to broaden out your resume and broaden out your skill set. So put that together, present the solution that you are, you are, are um, putting forth, make it easy and make it clear what the benefits to them are, to them personally. So you need to get with the stakeholders. You need to understand what it is that drives them and you need to make sure that whatever your plan is addresses those particular drivers. Not easy, it is different in every single situation and you still, are very likely to fail if it's a cultural thing that's that's going on in the company, which almost was what it sounds like. It may still fail, but that's your best chance to actually get something forward. If, and this is my, my other recommendation on this, if you can do a small test bed for your idea and your way of doing it, that's another great way to kind of prove it out. Um, so you, you know, okay, it's in my department, we're gonna do it these processes this way. And so you track the performance of that over two months, three months. Okay, there's no problems. We have better you know, retention here. See if there's a way to start it small and do a little test bed. And that will, that will help, uh, help get some more buy-in from people. Hope that helps you. Jody has our next question. It's how do you rein in an employee that spends twice as much time as necessary verbally discussing issues or, as it scrolls up, or instructions and constantly accumulates comp time uh, because of this? Set a time limit. Um, as much as I'm discussing issues or instructions and constantly accumulating comp time because of it. You know what, I'd probably, I, I would put them on, um, on a time limit, Jody. And I might actually, it sounds, a, it depends on how aggressive you wanna be with it. I'm kind of, I'm kind of thinking about it here a little bit. Um, I don't like people that are abusing things to, for extra comp time, that sort of thing. Um, not a big fan of it, and so I might call that out. You've had a, a, a much more comp time recently, and one of the things that I notice is that you are there's a lot of discussion around issues, instructions, that sort of thing. So what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to put it. We'd like to, I'd like to put a time limit on those discussions. So you have five minutes to discuss the tasks that you're doing, the projects that you're doing, that sort of thing. We're putting a limit on those discussions to kind of tamp that down just a little bit. I understand that you want to be clear, and this is what, what uh, he or she is going to say, is um, that, oh, well, I just I need to be crystal clear, otherwise I'm gonna waste time down the road. Well, you're already wasting time or spending time. Let's try to get some of that back and find a middle ground and a compromise to it. So you reference the comp time, actually, as an issue, because that might actually dial it back. They might think they're getting over on you just a little bit, but for a sanity sake, put a time limit on it. This happens a lot in meetings where you have one person that talks a ton. 
have a sidebar conversation and say, hey, I want to put a time limit on it, all right? So you get two minutes to talk about your issue because I just want to make sure that everybody else, and you give them a reason. Everybody else has a time, chance to talk, that sort of thing. Hey, whoever they're verbally discussing this with, they are taking away that person's time as well. So we want to make the most of that time. Let's try to keep those discussions limited to five minutes. If I give you the look, you know you've reached five minutes, and that's what, what I used to do in meetings all the time, the talkative person, and I'd give them that look like, and they'd know to, know to quiet down from there. Um, but that's what you can actually do with this other person as well. Um, just give them that look, but call it out, set the time limit. That's, that's gonna be it. If you wanna rein somebody in, you're gonna have to take that sort of action with it, and that's how I do it. Call it out. Let them know that you're aware that they're accumulating comp time in one of the areas that you think could be improved is how much they are discussing instructions and issues that are coming up. Let's put a limit on that. Let's look to 80, 20 that, get the most bang for your buck, deal with the biggest things first and foremost, and then we can deal with the rest down the road. Hope that helps, Jody. You may have tried that before. If it doesn't resonate, let me know and we'll, we'll, we'll ping back to it. Um, what if the team, your teammate is performing below average and during the coaching, he stated that he has anxiety and does not consider to seek professional help? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I asked what he plans to do going forward. He said, I'll be okay. I'll do better. I keep asking for specific actions that he can do or can I do for him, but answers are still too broad and I don't want to push him too hard. So it may be at this point, Sherry Bell, um, that you do have to start pushing just a little bit. You've, you've taken the first step. So you've asked him ways that you can help him improve. You've, you've, and perhaps what it is is you start offering suggestions. Or maybe it isn't that you offer suggestions. Maybe it is that you put forth plans, Sherry Bell. That might be what you do. Okay, so our performance still hasn't improved. So what I want to do in this case is I want to put you on a plan where we're going to meet and discuss every, you know, at, right before lunch, five minutes before lunch, what are the issues, where are you doing, what, what's going on, so that we can make sure that we're working on the right priorities, that you're on track, that you're getting any questions answered that you need to, and then we'll meet at the end of the day and discuss those things so you're ready to kick off tomorrow. But maybe you put a plan in place for this particular individual so that, so that he can kind of stay on track and that you can manage that anxiety. Again, so much of that anxiety is just, so much of anxiety is A, the unknown, you can help with that in, in many instances, um, and B is a certain level of overwhelm, and you can help in those instances as well. So maybe it is that instead of asking, like you have before, you actually start ordering, quite frankly, and trying things out and seeing what works and what doesn't work, and maybe making some tweaks from there. That's, uh, that's the way to deal with things. It's tough when people won't deal with those particular situations, um, but you can help them deal with it. A, asking like you have already, but B, telling when all else fails. Um, so I hope that helps out, Sherry Bell. All right, looks like I've kind of reached the end here. Hey, if you've got some questions or something pops into your head right after I, I click the finish button here on the Facebook Live session, and that often happens um, for people out there, then go ahead, you can drop them down in the comment section. I'll get them on the next episode. You can always direct message me or send me an email at cmatcameronmorsey.com. Just love to uh, be of service for you and help you as you go along through your week. Everybody take care out there, and I will see you on the next episode. Take care, Sherry Bell. Bye-bye.